Hey man, what's up? Hey dude, how you doing? I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing um um oh shit. Wait, what? What? What the fuck just happened? Wait, is my webcam on? Is this season two already? I thought this was still season one. I thought we were. Wait, let me check. Let me check. This is uh this is uh it's 2014, right? Uh, I I thought so too. Yeah. Wait, is this uh? Did we? Uh, what is this? Okay, ser seriously, dude. I was I was just calling you up because I wanted to, to talk about some adventure game shit or not. And uh, why, why are we why are we still talking on the phone if the webcams are on? That's a good question. Should we just put down the phones and just uh, you know? Let's let's put down the phones because the echo is fucking me up. Oh, the echo, right? Uh, we're we gonna put this on uh, vibration only. Ooh. So, how have you been? Right. Um, since we're doing this uh, uh, in the uh, newfangled way... Uh, I, I was seriously afraid you were going to say, since we're doing this in the nude. <laughs> <laughs> since we're Just doing you this. Wait. <laughs> Just you wait, dude. That's coming up. Oh, before I forget. Oh, yeah. Nice fest. I love the fest. The ladies love the fest. Cheers for the fest. Cheers for the first, and cheers for season two, um, um, and all the newfangled, spangled technology that comes with it. And may God bless us, everyone! Uh, fantastic. So, what have you been up to, dude? Um, I'm packing my life into little boxes, which is, you know, I'm not even going to say mental because, you know, some people might get that out of it, but I don't. It's just fucking annoying, and it's stressful, and it's pissing me off. Um... I'm moving this Friday. Hey! Hey! Uh, we'll have a virtual housewarming thing of a jig lined up uh, later on. Um, but, you know, apart from that whole um, pegging shit into boxes and finding out how much crap I've accumulated, uh, I'm doing fine. Awesome. I ate a sausage. You just froze up. No, I just ate a sausage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I was going to open the Google effects, but um, we're strictly uh, into it uh, for the old arcane technology, uh, which is why we did a little mindfuck at the beginning of this episode, because yeah. we're going to be talking about arcane technology, specifically text adventures. Right. Or so interactive fiction. Oh, you just spoiled it, didn't you? Right. That that is indeed the topic of of tonight's little podcast, and which is why we decided to you know fuck with your minds and do it the old fashioned way, and then you know technology happened, so this is technology phone out the window. What happened was the technology fucked with us, so we had to improvise, and that's how we came up with this little uh, meta mind fuck type thingy. At least we didn't do what we did last season, which was record a forty five minute episode that didn't record at all. Yeah, we we were fairly. But um, you know, we've we've learned uh, the our lessons and have uh, now we're just doing excess takes of everything. That's it. So with excess takes in mind, here's the fucking intro. The gargoyle has no function but sheer ugliness. And boom! boom! Oh, we're back! Oh my yeah. god! And my you know, phone my... didn't even ring. No. Wait. Let me do that again. No. <laughs> oh god! No. 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 <laughs> no. And, and the head um... comes off. Yeah. Thank you. Um. <laughs> so shit. Um. Yeah. So the headphones are back on season two, newfangled technology. We're on YouTube, and we didn't no. announce this episode no. because we're absolute dirtbags that way. Yeah. But we um, have zero viewers at this yeah. point. So. Um... And that's how we like it. I mean, uh, go support our patron. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we love you guys. Oh, we dearly love you, one and two no, people. Anyway, um, this is going to be interesting because right off the bat, let me say that um, text adventures, uh, it's not a genre I have a lot of experience with. You know, I'm, um, 
I'm a bit spoiled in the sense that I only really started playing adventure games in the late 90s to early 2000s. So I sometimes get the idea that I'm of a generation where you can't really cut out the graphics. and You can't simplify the graphics to an extent where you've got something like an AGI game with the parser going. It's just, uh, it's just not visual enough for me. I I've played a few text adventures, but uh, nothing that really stuck. But you, of course, my friend, are of the old school. And no, no, seriously. I'm, I'm, I'm not really that old school because text adventures are um, uh, a bit before my time as well. Ooh. There you go. Yeah. Off to, off to a classy start there. Actually, um, speaking of how old text adventures are, let me just get in and, and we uh, retweeted this. I thought that, you were passing the ball to me, but fuck it. What? <laughs> I thought you were passing the ball to me to start my little spiel, but fuck it. No, 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 no. I, I would, no, no. This is my ball. It's mine now. You're not right. getting it. You get um, the ball. Anyway. You, you can um, jiggle the ball all you want. Something that was discovered recently was um, the very first text adventure of all time, potentially. And I think it's called, I think it's simply called Adventure or something like that. And it's from 1974, and it, it, it was really innovative because along with being the first text adventure of all time, it was also the first text adventure engine of sorts. You know, it, it would allow you to play these little stories, and it would allow you to create your own uh, simultaneously. Oh, so we're going to do the history thing now? Yeah, Adventure was from 1974. It was a mainframe yeah. computer game. Yeah. Uh, it was the first of its kind, obviously. And uh, it was one of the earliest examples of uh, open source technology because uh, there are a million different versions of Adventure out there. Yeah. Uh, because everyone would jump in. I mean, uh, Adventure was used uh, in uh, courses on database programming. Uh, students would be told to uh, jump in and do their own version of Adventure, uh, mm. which is how Adventure games got their name in the first place. That's that's interesting, and it lends some perspective to what we're going to talk about. Yeah, can I just get my spiel out of the way, which is that uh, uh, the both of us, actually, now that you've uh, preempted my uh, first strike here, was uh, I was going to start by saying that I was born in 1980, and uh, that means I was a, a young little tyke when, uh, when graphic adventures were developed, which were, yeah. let's just say, like uh, 1982, 83, something like that. Yeah. I was you barely done sucking my mom's tits. So uh, we're well into graphic adventures once I actually uh, acquire the know-how to operate a computer, let alone play a game. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, even though uh, the first uh, games that I played were uh, parser-driven, they were also graphic adventures. And I'm not even talking Space Quest 2. I'm talking, you know, Commodore 64 uh, uh, adventure games where... Uh, Donald Duck's Playground and shit. Yeah, well, Donald Duck's Playground was, was not an adventure game, but uh, I'm, I'm talking like the uh, Fantastic Four game, which I've mentioned on the Square Waves FM podcast, I think, right. uh, which, which is, it is ostensibly a text adventure, but there are these little, I mean, think uh, think like Roberto Williams' first uh, adventure games, you know, Mystery Oh, good heroes. heavens, no, why, why the fuck would I think about Roberto Williams' first adventure games? I don't know, because you're not wearing pants, and it's just, you know. <laughs> uh, well, so maybe I am. And, uh, and, and, and the thing is that it, even though I'm, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, the history of adventure games go, I'm kind of a young'un. Uh, when I was a young'un, you were just barely a zygote in your father's testicles. Uh, I mean, how old are you again? Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much of a young'un you were. Uh, I'm from 88. So um, you were a fairly old young'un. You know, you, you just stopped wearing your diapers. Something like that. I mean, I was still sucking my mom's tits, but still, yeah. that, you know, that's how you know family parties work and shit. Yeah, that's um, all about ethics and games journalism for you. Boom! <laughs> I, just, I just, I just knocked out a lamp. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, uh, so, I'm gonna have your ass for that later. <laughs> So anyway, we're not we're not you know we're not very proficient in text adventures or interactive fiction and such. But that doesn't mean that we don't know how they work because it's not like it's not like they're completely foreign I I to us. I mean, we both played AGI games. We have both dabbled in text adventures, and I've dabbled in trying to create text adventures because you know the written word and all that. And that's actually what I'm here to talk about today: the pros and cons. Uh, that was a weird way of saying cons, sorry. Uh, the pros and cons 
of uh, interactive fiction versus graphic uh, adventures and what they yeah, can do. And, and, what let's, they can. and let's get this uh, out of the way too, um, because you hold a degree in uh, literature, isn't that right? Uh, and I actually used to study comparative literature, but I only lasted about a semester because, um, well, basically it was shite. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the short story. Well, my, my excuse is I was stoned throughout the most, of my, most of my bachelor's degree in literature. So uh, if I'd been go. stoned, that would probably have helped. Um, but I wasn't. I was uh, stone cold sober, and it didn't do nothing for me. But it did, uh, it did, uh, it did teach me some stuff about uh, how you know how a story is constructed. Uh, that whole Aristotle beginning, middle, end thing from uh, the Poetics. Oh, right, 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 right. And uh, uh, when I was an exchange student in the United States, I took a creative writing lesson or a course or whatever you call it. Uh, where, uh, sorry, I'm really classy today. I'm also really gassy, but you know, this, this is like karma for doing an unscheduled episode. Exactly. I mean, we were going to end this podcast by vomiting blood or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can yeah. Hold it in. Hold it in. Also, I said classy, not gassy, but shit. Uh, either one will do. Yeah. Um, uh, the whole idea about interactive fiction, uh, as you said, uh, beginning, middle, and end, and uh, you know, um, basically being uh, all about the written word. Um, mm -hmm. How that translates uh, into a, a, a cohesive tale uh, uh, using a parser interface and uh, yeah, all that stuff. It's uh, it's 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 not a foreign concept. It's it's what I would consider like the stepping stone of uh, literary evolution, uh, because you started out uh, doing, um, uh, you, you started out basically, you know, telling campfire stories, and then the right. printing press was invented, and then you invented the computer, and all of a sudden you found a new medium of telling stories. Oh, also movies came along at some point, but who cares? Yeah, and I'm going way back to the campfire stuff. You know, stories were interactive in the sense that you know they were basically told, you know, um, I was going to say mouth to mouth, that comes off as a <laughs> sexual. <laughs> they, were, they were told uh, mouth to ear, you know, people were telling each other these stories, and whenever a new narrator was telling it, you might have noticed that something would change, you know, it would change from retelling to retelling. Um, right. And this, this was also something that would happen with, uh, say, medieval folk songs. You know, you would just basically keep adding and modifying shit, and and it would become sort of an interactive experience, I suppose. You could you could gather all these various versions of one tale and have these uh, added nuances to it. That was a really good fucking pronunciation of that word, wasn't it? Hey, you're a you're a you're a hero I'm of my book. Vaguely French here. <laughs> so, uh, um, so, 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 uh, what the hell was my point? Because uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm distracted by the fact that we actually got a viewer in now. Hi, Kevin. Um, what I was going to say was, we've been kind of spoiled uh, with the advent of adventure games, uh, point-and-click adventure games, uh, uh, all the way up until now when we've got this resurgence and stuff, where we are kind of expected to, uh, you know, follow a linear story through a, a, a progression of sorts and then reach the end and then that's the end of that and then you can possibly go back and replay some bits of it but why would you bother now with text adventures you've got um you've got the uh, the advent or the advantage that's the word i'm looking for mm -hmm. the advantage of this being pretty much a singular person's uh, vision so yeah. in, instead of having to, uh, because there's a lot of planning involved in doing a graphic adventure game, obviously, not only are you planning out the story and the puzzles, but you've got some dude who's doing the graphics, some dude who's doing the design, some, and all of a sudden you've got this huge team of people yeah. uh, with a the, with the text adventure, you've got one guy doing all of it. So, you, uh, so text adventures, uh, at least from my perspective, have always had this advantage of uh, the, the amount of freedom that you have of exploring the story is just monumental compared to uh, to any graphic adventure game, really. It depends what you set out to do, because um, many, many text adventures of ye olden days were actually one-to-one -one adaptions of existing literary works. Um, off the top of my head, I remember playing one. Uh, it had graphics in it, very primitive CGA, uh, CGA graphics. And it was uh, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. So you had this game that that uh, followed the book to a T, 
and you would have to do what the characters of the you know what what the main character of the book uh, did, or you'd be dead. And similarly, I know of uh, at least one James Bond game called A View to a Kill, based on on the Ian Fleming novel of the same name, oh, which is supposed to be shit because you know it, it follows the book so closely that you know if you forgot to do just one tiny little thing, then you're dead, and you and you won't does, know you're dead until like hours later. Does Christopher Walken yeah. show up in that? <laughs> uh, no, because he's not in the book, unfortunately. Uh, ah, but Ian, Fleming, Ian Fleming was the guy who, in all earnestness, in The Man of, uh, with the Golden Gun, uh, wrote that gay people can't whistle. So if you ever need to spot a homosexual <laughs> man, just walk up to him and go, and see if he whistles back. <laughs> okay, and, that's uh, interesting. Um, because fuck logic. Uh, but I, actually, I was I was not really aware that most uh, early text adventures were just adaptations of uh, of, of existing I material. I didn't say most, but I wanted to get the idea of. I mean, certainly you're right about the ex the additional degree of freedom if you're doing something original. But uh, apart from you know uh, the advent of adventure games way back when, uh, this was also kind of the beginning of the licensed game. But you know that that's a whole other story. Well, licensed, yeah. licensed in in a very loose sense. I mean, any uh, anyone with a because again, we're we're going back to the uh, you know the time when uh, uh, computer game players were you know computer engineers. These were expensive yeah. uh, pieces of hardware, and these were just guys trying to unwind. And I say guys because not a lot of uh, women were in the industry at that point. So you've got a lot of you know bored engineers who are just sitting around fucking around with the uh, database software, and uh, you know. At that point, you know who's who's selling a game. I mean, you don't even need a license to start, you know, typing out your uh, your favorite fan fiction, uh, and then and then you know put an interactive spin on it. Um, uh, oh, de definitely, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about those early beginnings. I'm I'm t talking about when they went commercial because they certainly did. I mean, you you had a lot of commercial text adventures by, I suppose, the late seventies, early eighties would be kind of yeah. the for that. Right, exactly. Because we, we, and, they continue, and they continue doing it because let's not forget that King's Quest, when it came out and blew everyone's minds with its realistic 3D graphics, was insanely. I mean, it was it it had a uh, it must have been so demanding on on the machinery of the day. I mean, yeah, I, I and people imagine how rich a fucker you would have to be to own a computer that could play King's Quest. So. <laughs> I know. So was that, but but text adventures were, I suppose, fairly uh, light on on resources. Uh, I suppose you're right, and and we do have to mention Infocom at some point, so we might as well get that out now. I mean, whenever when, whenever someone mentions interactive fiction or text adventures, uh, if you're if you're of the uh, playing school that knows what a text adventure is, your mind immediately goes to Infocom. Show me a person who doesn't think Infocom and the, the little blue screen and uh, you know the little parser uh, cursor and shit. Um, that's that's the that's the thing everyone thinks about. And 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 the reason they do that is because Infocom not only ruled it. Uh, ruled the uh, interactive fiction in a way that Sierra ruled uh, the graphic adventure game genre in the late '80s. Jesus Christ, I'm gassy and, cl and classy. Um, they 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 did it because they were they were really really great at it, yeah. And uh, and and a lot of a lot of the stuff that came out of Infocom was, uh, you know, original titles and original ideas. And that's kind of what I want to zone in on because a lot of the things that uh, particularly Infocom did, but I suppose other people who were doing text adventures as well. Although you would be uh, you would press me if you were to ask me, you know, what other companies were there. I have no fucking idea. Uh, but they were doing stuff that you couldn't do in a graphic adventure game. And that's really what I kind of wanted to, you know, zone in on. Thanks of it. This is a rehearsal. We're doing the real episode next week. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm just, you know, setting up the ball, really just like, like carrying my hands behind it and tossing it to you and you just fumble the ball and just go, oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example. A, a, a text adventure that I haven't played, but uh, that I've read a lot about because it was, it was dearly fascinating. And the reason that I haven't played it is because after reading it, I, reading about it, I was really confident that I would be absolutely shit at it. Um, 
A Mind Forever Voyaging. Ever heard of this? Uh, I've heard of it, and it's uh, it's entered my conscience as well. I know that much. Um, but but um, interesting choice of I've, words. I've never, I've never played it, uh, but I think I've also read that um, it's good and difficult. So so yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's an interesting choice of word. It has entered my mind because what you're doing is basically playing a comatose patient or computer or something or other. Anyway, you're not really in control of a main character per se, but you're uh, you're influencing the world in which a character moves around in, um, which is which is a really abstract concept and not something that's really conducive to let's say visualizing something. And it's it goes back to this idea of uh, having a novel that is deemed unfilmable you know when they do movie yeah. adaptations they always go oh the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy is unfilmable how can you ever yeah, yeah. make it lunch is unfilmable 50 this shades is... of gray is unfilmable i wish it was <laughs> yes it should have been jesus uh, anyway, yeah it, it harkens back to that but of course they will, they will Saga is unfilmable. There, there will also be people uh, unwatchable yeah, sorry but uh, there will uh, always be people who also prefer the books anyway. Um, I count myself among those those for stuff like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the last Harry Potter novel I thought was a pretty brilliant book. And, and the, the films that they turned it into were okay, but they weren't as good as I found the book. Um. And Fifty Shades of Grey, of course. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, Kevin over in the IRC challenge just goes, all right, in the Mind Forever Voyaging, you're actually playing a simulation. You are Prism, the world's first sentient computer. Well, I said it was a computer. I said you were you're... spoiling it, guys. All right, that, that's just the premise. Anyway. Oh, um, spoiler. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I've, I've, I've been listening a lot to, you know, Chris from uh, Square Waves FM uh, talking about the, all the text adventures he's playing and uh, all, the, uh, all the freedom that you have while playing a text adventure game, uh, we've talked previously about uh, you know how point and click uh, interfaces uh, either you know take away from your uh, freedom or they uh, you know inhibit your uh, I mean the, the game sort of guesses what you want to do instead of you flat out telling it what you want to do and and, and stuff like that and. Uh, uh, text adventures work in the exact opposite way, where uh, you are you're completely free to input whatever the hell you want into the uh, into the text parser, and then it just uh, it just sort of if if the designer thought of it, then it can produce a response in that way. And there are multiple solutions to um, you know moving around the game world. For yeah. instance, he was talking about this pirate adventure game where you know he's stuck in uh, he's stuck in a, a cabin on board a pirate ship, and he's been uh, you he's know taking stuck in a, he's stuck in a cat cabin. Kevin, you know, the cabin on a ship, uh, uh, and, and he has to escape, and, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's a female, and females aren't supposed to be on pirate ships, and so he has to, you know, first he tries to, you know, jump out the window, and, oh, his dress gets uh, stuck on the windowsill, and then he, you know, tries to throw, uh, you know, tie sheets into a rope and climb up the rope, and then, you know, pirates rape and kill him, and then, the, you know, all sorts of stuff, but there's, like, a ton of different things you can do. Yeah. Whereas in a, in a graphic adventure game, every time you had an option like that, you would have to sit down with an animator and go, right, I want this and this and this to happen. Can you animate that? Come back in two weeks. We'll put that in the game, and so on and so forth. And so way, back of, when you would, uh, way back when you would also have had to, you know, consider how much, you know, how resource demanding your game was going to be. And I, I was going to mention that uh, Brian Moriarty uh, worked at Infocom, didn't he? And, yes, uh, he did. Yes, and, he did. Uh, you've probably watched watched his uh, post mortem on Lou. Yes, I did. He also talks about you know how how difficult. Stuff. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I loved it. Um, but he talks a lot about you know how how demanding it was to put uh, you know how much you really had to consider what you were putting into the game and how his mind was blown when uh, Steve Purcell did like that three-dimensional animation of Bishop Mandible getting his head blown to bits. Mm. Best animation in ev any adventure game, by the way. Best yeah. ever. Beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right because uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, what the hell was that game called that he, he did at Infocom that, uh, you know, Chris won't shut up about on the Square Wave 7? I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what it was called, but now I can't remember it. Yeah, it wasn't Fascination. It was because uh, that's a cocktail vision game. Anyway, uh, the, the point being is uh, that, 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 you know, he had all the freedom in the world. If he thought of something, he could just sit down and 30 minutes later, it would be in the game. 
Uh, and with a graphic adventure game, you have to sit down and uh, tell other people what your vision is, and then they come back to you and they show you something, and you go, "Was that close to your vision or not? And should we put it in the game or not?" Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so that's that's what I would consider the strength of interactive fiction. It's Obviously, right. oh, Trinity. Oh, sorry, Kevin just said, "All right, uh, Trinity was the uh, game that Brian Moriarty did." And you, can, uh, and you can, if I may, do a bit of plugging. Uh, I'll admit I haven't played this game. But um, you can also fuck with the formula of the text adventure and introduce stuff like sound effects, music, uh, speech. Of course, you, you couldn't really do that way back when. But I know of a game that I can't remember what it's called by uh, a pair of developers who are also brothers uh, called uh, Javier and um, what the hell is that other guy's name? Carlos, I think, uh, Cabrera. Uh, who this podcast is just full of us just not remembering names. Yeah. <laughs> this is fantastic. They, and, they, and they made this... Uh, I'm actually going to look it up because they made this uh, text adventure game, which is um, a cyberpunk game, I think. Uh, and what they did was they, you know, they're playing with the formula and that it has a music, right? It's called Cypher. Uh, it's a cyberpunk text adventure from mm -hmm. the Cabrera Brothers. Interesting. And it, looks, it, has, it has limited graphics and it has music. I don't think it has voice, but you know, but at heart, it's a text adventure. And and I, I've wait, 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 back up, back up. It had it had graphics in it. Then it's not part of the discussion. I think it. I don't know. They they write that it's a text adventure. You know, that isn't just. Uh, Right, but okay, so so let's let's get the definition out of the way, shall we? Because uh, when you think of a graphic adventure game, obviously you're going to go to the Lucas Arts or CR Online thing. You're going to go to the King's Quest or the Day of the Tentacle thing. But before that, you had Mystery House, you had Time Zone, you had uh, things that were really just text adventures, but they did show you something on the screen. They did show you some line drawing or some shit. Uh, and uh, I would say that's the burgeoning era of uh, graphic adventure games, because instead of just painting a picture with your words, you're painting a picture on screen, and you are devil's advocate here. You are taking some imagination away from the player, because if you just have you know colorful prose, just like reading a book, you're painting a picture inside the person's head, whereas if you're playing a, a graphic adventure game, you're painting a picture on the screen, and then you're just telling people to interact with that. I suppose it's true to a certain extent. You know, I would say that those early uh, graphic adventures had like one foot in one ditch and the other foot in another ditch. Well, to be fair, Sierra had a foot in, in either ditch way, way late into their graphic adventure days uh even as going as i would say going as far as their point and click days really because a lot of the uh let's just say asinine uh, ideas of, of text adventures uh kind of carried over into the design philosophy you'd have to talk to anatoly about that but uh yeah i think you know what i mean I think, I think you're right yeah you're definitely right uh cool so uh so anyway the um you know the uh the, the pros of a text adventure game, and I, I, when I say text adventure, I mean interactive fiction. I mean just the, you, you know, mean info screen. blue screen. Bare bones. Bare bones, no graphics, not even an ASCII drawing, just, uh, just, uh, just, just text, really just text. No uh, ethics. No ethics, no. Not even uh, a little press. Not even a little, not even a little Baldwin. Not even a tiny little Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you've got that, then you are uh, then you are uh, kind of you know you're tapped directly into the imagination of the player. And if you're a shit writer, it's going to come off as a shit adventure. If you're a really really talented writer, it's going to come off as a a you know uh, like painting a portrait uh, or a, a landscape inside someone's head. And mm -hmm. if you're a sadistic author, it's going to come off as hitchhikers to the fucking galaxy. Yeah. Uh, over on the IRC channel, Kevin made a point in that uh, he doesn't consider uh, those early uh, graphic adventures to be graphic adventures because you didn't specifically interact with the graphics. That's and not I, my I point suppose, at all. I suppose both of you have a point. 
Yeah, but my point is stronger. Thanks, Kevin. Um, my point is stronger because uh, because uh, again, this is why why would you read a book if you could watch the movie? And the and the reason for doing that and and why do people hate the uh, you know the movie adaptation when they've read the novel? It's it's usually because the pictures that were painted in their head when they read that text on the page is not what's translated into the movie. It's someone else's vision of what was in the author's mind, and your vision is. Not only is it going to be different, but in in the back of your head, it's also going to be superior. This is how I imagine Arthur Dent. This yeah. is how I imagine Frodo and such. And who the hell is this old guy playing Rincewind and all this shit? Hmm. Yeah. So, so that's my definition of a text adventure. Now, uh, what uh, what graphic adventures do for you, on the other hand, is I suppose you could argue, devil's advocate again, that they do take away a bit of your freedom to explore because every time you do explore a different avenue, someone has to animate it or someone has to put it in and it has to go through a number of different people. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it's trickier to it's it's trickier to implement. Let's get that out of the way. I mean, we've both worked with the AGS and constructing a a graphic adventure. You know, it's not as difficult now as it must have been way back when. But you know, um, it's Buck City basically. It's it's very very difficult to do something that's completely free of bugs. Um, oh yeah. So you go you go work on Assassin's Creed Unity instead, and forget all about adventure games. But uh, but yeah, it's it's relatively easy to construct a text adventure, I'd say, um, especially with today's engines. Yeah, you were thinking. Uh, I mean, what, one one thing that info uh, info. Comes. I was going to say Infogrumps for some reason. That's a French developer. Infogrum. Infogrumps. Infogrumps, like old men sitting around <laughs> typewriters typing in basic code. Um, <laughs> 10. Hello, stupid. Hello, nurse. 20. Go to 10. 30. Go to, go to great go sponge bath. Um, uh, now, uh, what, what Infocom did was that they developed what's known as the Z engine, or Z engine, depending on which English speaking part of the world you're in, uh, which is basically what powered every uh, uh, adventure game that they did, which is, you know, the same thing that Sierra did with SCI and AGI and what LucasArts did with uh, Scum and such. Uh, they had their own stuff. One and one. Yeah. So, uh, which, which also makes it easier to play text adventures these days because, of course, people have gone back and done their own uh, Z-Engine interpreters for Windows, so you no longer have to boot in DOS and all this stuff. Um, which is very, uh, but but um, the fundamental core part of a text adventure, as opposed to a graphic adventure game, is that you can uh, sort of leap out of the box, out of the constraints that uh, a graphic adventure has, because inevitably, in a graphic adventure game, no matter how many verbs you have on the screen, Maniac Mansion, I'm looking at you, yeah. um, no matter how many fucking verbs you have, you're still limited to that number of verbs. So you, you can't... Are, yeah, you can't... Yeah. You can't uh, as Scott Murphy once lamented, you cannot fuck the dead body. You know, presumably mm -hmm. you can't fuck the dead body. You certainly can in Maniac Mansion, but you can in Space Quest 2, and you are one sick motherfucker for trying to do that. The only one I know who would be sick enough to do it is Mark Crow. Yes. <laughs> and you can't, you can't moon the... Uh... Uh, the surveillance cameras aboard Vohal's asteroid, something I didn't know you could do until uh, until someone pointed out to me like a month ago or something. Oh. I'd never tried that. Yeah. Um, there's good. always like bits and bits and pieces you can you can do. And even though it doesn't uh, what Kevin Kevin says Z machine. No, it's called the Z engine. Z machine? Fuck it. Who cares? Anyway, stop distracting me, Kevin. Um what, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. No, uh, what, what it does is uh, every time you think of, uh, of of doing something, not just as a joke, but as a part of a puzzle solution, you can put that in the game. If you're supposed to, you know, tear the pocket out of a, a piece of clothing and then uh, whirl it into something useful like a pouch or something, and then tie a knot on the end of it and such, it becomes a much more it becomes a much more creative experience for the player, I would argue. Instead well, it's of interesting. It's, it, 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 it's it's a strangely tactile experience because you have yes, to see exactly. all these interactions that are not limited to touch, smell, taste, you know. Yeah, because if you're playing, all right, all right, it's the Z machine, Kevin, I get it, thank you. Um, in the I've just, from the infernal Z machine. Right, I've, I've just scared away our only viewer. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, we love you. Donate to our Patreon. Anyway, uh, so uh, what 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 I what I love about it is it's it's kind of comparable to uh, playing a Dungeons and Dragons role playing game as to uh, you know sitting around uh, you know building Lego blocks or something because you know the Lego blocks fit together somehow. Uh, there there are certain set rules that you can do and can't do. Whereas yeah. with a Dungeons and Dragons game, you can just say I fuck the dead body. Yay! Yeah. And you'll step on the Legos and it hurts like shit. That's that's what you'd call a bug. That's what you'd call the uh, Sierra Quick message. <laughs> you you did something we didn't think of. Ah, for the love of God! <laughs> Infograms again. You stepped on a Lego. You die. <laughs> Good fucking riddance. I'll piss off you. Right. All right. <laughs> Side note: I just I love yeah, these little weird. City. <laughs> I just love the, the the weird error messages that some of the old DOS games did. Of course, the best one is uh, "I'm free from Rise of the Triad," but I also love the uh, um, you know you did something we didn't think of in Sierra games. <laughs> I'm like, what? Really? <laughs> should, yeah. should I be rewarded? I love those that just go, "Oh, oh, something went wrong." <laughs> <laughs> like even the game is kind of embarrassed. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so um, so anyway, I'm, okay, I've, I've been babbling about this for too long. I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself. So in your mind, pros and cons about interactive fiction versus graphic adventures. Go. I suppose the pro is that, you know, the imagination of the player, uh, much like reading a novel, is uh, coming to the fore. Whereas I agree that a graphic adventure can't really replicate that. Um, I feel you could do more interesting stuff with, with text adventures. I mean, you could... You could do like these um, headphone adventures where you had, you know, I suppose it doesn't hurt to go, you're at a rainy cemetery and then play some, you know, uh, binaural sounds of, of rain pouring down and church bells ringing in the background. Um, right. I feel like the genre, uh, you know, one con of it is that it's, it's essentially limited to... Um, very very arcane technology i mean it's it still goes back to what adventure did way back when when you would play it on a terminal and i do think that you can take a step further without necessarily compromising the strengths that you get when you uh, appeal to the player's imagination so I, I would say a con is that it is usually very rigid and very conservative like text adventures are rigid and conservative. They are in, in you know new text adventures. I suppose you know. I, I know there is a community that that you know dapples in just writing text adventures in these old engines, and um, I, I think it's a bit of a shame that no one is you know. I, I've yet to play that uh, Cabrera Brothers game, but I suppose it's it's a step in in an interesting direction you know i i nice, nice roll of the tongue by the way no uh, 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 ke, what i said nice roll of the tongue by the way cabrera brothers yeah. would you like to roll my sausage no, but we didn't sorry, have time um, anyway, <laughs> um i was gonna say something else Yes, um, something over on the RRC channel that your new best friend Kevin brought up is, uh, and I know you made an instant rebuttal, is that um, many, many books have illustrations. And this was something interesting that I learned uh, when I studied comparative literature. Uh, and I, I can't speak, I know this, I can't pronounce shit, you know, uh, our Patreon money is going to buy me an English course. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. <laughs> a very cheap English course. Anyway, um, stuff the, like the Shakespeare sonnets uh, would usually have some interesting stuff going on in uh, how it was written out. You know, you would have occasionally these little symbols on the page, like a crescent moon, or or you would have these indentations of the text itself, and it would it would mean something. It would have some. Uh, there would be some symbolical meaning. Uh, in Denmark, you would have a guy like um, you know a psalm writer who would uh, write a tribute to the king and and actually write it so that the text itself was would kind of form this chalice. So um, the concept of messing about with the text to kind of give you some uh, extra sensory experience is not an, an it's not a new concept that I'm uh, making up here. No, but also your your whole point about uh, um, 
because th this is going back to the discussion about uh, you know are our adventure games just conservative in general and are we just fucking with a formula just to be fucking with it when in it, it when it is in fact perfect to begin with and it, it that's a discussion that I, you know, there's a lot of leeway in that. But when you're talking about text adventures, you're talking about the medium of the written word. And once you start introducing elements like audio, like speech, like, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give the text challenge a pass because I think that's fucking ingenious. But, uh, uh, but, but any, anything beyond painting a picture in the reader's mind, which is what novels do, which is what, uh, you know, the written word has done since the beginning of the written word. Uh, text adventures are just an extension of that, it, it, with the only exception that it gives the player, um, you know, a, a, a tactile influence on the story. The same way campfire uh, stories did back in, you know, when we're you still banging to. rocks against women. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, uh, but again, you had, uh, you had those illustrations. You had the, uh, you know, the odd symbols on Shakespeare's pages that would mean something. And you had yeah, the but he was just a wanker. And, and you had the campfire atmosphere. You know, try telling a, uh, try going into a well-lit environment with your friends and tell one of those uh, scary stories, you know, with a punchline like, and his ghost is here tonight. Do it around mm. a campfire, and you gain right. that extra dimension, you know. Uh, and I, I think that there is something to be gained there for text adventures as well. Ah, but still, but still, but still, but still. But wouldn't you? I mean, have you ever uh, brought a uh, scary book or a funny book or whatever to, you know, like a beachfront? You're sitting on a beachfront and you're reading reading a Tom Clancy novel, and you go, "There's not a SWAT team in sight, but I'm still, uh, you know." Uh, Ostensibly, you enjoy Tom Clancy you novel. Know, I'm just assuming that. Um, that that uh, much is that much is true. But you know, in that sense, I feel like you know, I you know, um, you're still in the story. That's my point. You're yeah, still it, because it, it, once you get captivated by that, the entire world around you just just fades away, just floats away. That's if that's you're what text reading, adventures can if do. You're reading, if you're reading really good stuff, but on occasion, I feel like the outside environment can prove distracting. You know, I can't listen to. I can't listen to, I don't know, um, Mr. Bungle while reading H.P. Lovecraft. You know, I need something more somber. You know, I need some... some well, again, you're, uh, again, you're talking about outside influences uh, as well, opposed to the written word. Well, reading Tom Clancy is an outside influence. <laughs> you know? no, having, having, having seagulls swarm by you and steal your food is an out, outside influence. It is, but it, it, that's a distraction, not an influence. You know, I, I think maybe maybe I'm being too too idealistic because what what a graphic adventure will do, and this is the this is the pro of a graphic adventure game. It has all these sensory um, feedback things at its disposal. It has sound. It has graphics. Uh, Leisha Suit Larry Seven had uh, like a scratch card you could sniff at. It had it had all this uh, sensory input that it could use to uh, entrench you into the world. Uh, yeah. Whereas a text adventure is reliant solely upon an author's uh, capable hands of, of, of pushing you into a story through, you know, prose. Obviously, it takes a lot more, uh, you know, patience to get into a text adventure because there's a lot of reading, and apparently yeah. we don't like reading anymore. Um, no. So, so, so that's that's a that, I, I guess that's a pro of, of a graphic adventure game is that it has all these sensory inputs at its disposal, and 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 it could use all of those to tell a story. And once you add all those elements into it, you start appreciating other areas of mastery. Like this is really good sound design, and these graphics are really really nice. Even if the game is shit, you can still appreciate yeah. graphics and sound and such. Yeah. With a text adventure, it's the author's biscuits. Or yeah, and, and, and if he's a shit biscuit cooker, then fuck it, the game is awful. If it's a bare bone text adventure, you know, I, I don't disagree here, but I think I'm I'm willing to offer the text adventure genre a certain uh, you know degree of leeway that that you're not, and uh, I'm not gonna let that split us because I, I do think you're very much right. <laughs> I but win because course, of perseverance. Course, so am I. You just don't know it yet. All right. Yeah, you win because you're moving. I still have the ball. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Let go my ball, Singling. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what else are we going to... Oh, wait. I, I, I was, I was going to tell you an idea that I had. Uh, for Because uh, you know, cause I like coming up with game ideas and not following through. You've probably noticed this. Um, oh, uh, can I get something out of the way first? Because I'm looking at the IRC channel again. And, uh, Is it balls? Uh, 
Other side note, scratch and, scratch and sniff feely including in uh, Leather Goddess of Phobos, which was from Infocom. Right. That's a text adventure, right? That so is. A game about leather leather goddesses had scratch and sniff. Yeah, I'm I'm as I'm as disgusted as you are. And also, I'm not saying that you know the text adventures were uh, or or Infocom were because Infocom had feelies in the box. They invented the whole idea of feelies. You got like 3D glasses and little maps and shit, things that were supposed to you know pull you into the world. Um, and and it's it's purely an idealistic. Uh, idea of mine that a text adventure is reliant solely upon the author and if the uh, publishing company that puts this game out wants to put all these little knickknacks into the box to make you even more uh, you know sucked into the world that it's creating then fair play but it has to stand and fall on the pros that's in the game and the interaction that you get in the game how much time did the author spend in allowing you to, you're yawning, aren't you? I can tell. No, no, no. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking that you know. Um, yeah, again, I think you're being very idealistic because, again, going back to Brian yeah. Moriarty, going back to Brian Moriarty, uh, when he describes the manual of Loom, you know, the book of of, uh, of drafts, uh, he mentions that this was uh, this was something he liked to do for his. Uh, for his games in general, also way back when at Infocom, you know, he liked putting something in that um, explained the game world a bit and, and added a different kind of visual tactile uh, experience. He doesn't use those words, I'll, I'll give you that, but you know, uh, in many cases, that was the designer, the guy who held the written word, who wanted to add a little something extra. Right, so he wasn't as idealistic as I was, and I, I, I get it. I get it. You want to put he, he put an audio drama in the loom box. It was fucking. It was that was brilliant because he added yet another dimension to it. You could listen to that thing on your way home. I'm, I'm not against that at all. Uh, in in the same sense that, uh, that 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 saying that a graphic adventure game should only be the sum of its parts. It should be the puzzles, the sound, the graphics, and the interface, and that's it. And you can't put anything extraneous around it. Can, you you remember? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil this. We had. The two of us, uh, along with Agustin Cortez, had this idea of an adventure game that pushed the boundaries beyond just the sensory input and what you got in the box and such. We had this idea for the agency, uh, the game that we wanted to make that uh, sadly Agustin had to jump out because he somehow acquired a Lovecraft license and it's still kind of... It, uh, it might still happen someday, but you, probably in 10 years when you've all forgotten of, of the spoilers that we uh, right. made today. Yeah, uh, not to spoil too much, but we did have the idea of breaking the fourth wall in a very, very real degree. Something that we did not invent. I, I, will, I will be quick to say this. We're not the first uh, people to think of this. Um, there's a game for the GameCube called Eternal Darkness uh, something something, um, which uh, which also which also messes with your head in that it's very, very, it very, very memorable game. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I've been told it is, but I suck at survival horror, so that's why I'm not mentioning it all. But it, it did fuck with your mind in the sense that it, you know, it would pretend to delete all of your save games on the memory card. It would pretend to, you know, turn the volume up and down and such, you know, breaking the fourth wall in that kind of sense. And that's the same idea we kind of had with uh, the agency. And that's yeah. another dimension adding onto uh, something that's, you know, but in its sure. pure sense, I think a text adventure should stand and fall with, uh, you know. The red yeah. board. So, Sanity's Requiem. Thank you, Kevin. You're the angel on my shoulder, and also the devil. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do, do you do you have a word in Edgewise before I tell you about the text adventure of my dreams? Um, I don't think I have any words to. You know, I, I've said my piece, uh, and and I just want to say that you know. Uh, and you've been I shut like down at every turn. Yeah. You, you like saying that you're the devil's advocate. Uh, in reality, I would say that's me because my only argument is really that, you know, in a world where um, it's all about sticking to your guns and doing the pure text adventures, the pure graphic adventures, I would argue that you also don't get as much innovation. You, you need a low to put scratch and sniff and to put a parser in Leisha Suit Larry 7. 
Right, but you, again, does it really need, need innovation? You need, you need some experiments once in a while. You know, you 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 could yeah, write a wave and just uh, keep going if it oh, works. Shit but. shit, but that's that's the thing with the power of the written word. You have innovation, and innovation does not lie in the technology; it lies in the narrative itself. You can do shit like uh, a mind forever voyaging, and you can do shit that uh, that no one could ever dream of. No one could ever visualize. Uh, Obviously, someone has to dream of it, but you couldn't visualize it. You can just tell it, uh, mm -hmm. which is which, which is where the innovation lies within text adventures. Within graphic adventures, you have to fuck with the formula if you want to be innovative. And this is why we're having the entire discussion that you know graphic adventure games are stale and they're not fucking with the formula enough. What can you do? You've already got the attention of all the senses, and so far, our computers can produce fart smells. So we have to put scratch and sniffs in the boxes for that to happen. Uh, with text adventures, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some, uh, you know, <laughs> software developers with BO problems that have managed to uh, get their computer to produce fart smells. I think I think Valve just, were, were creating a, a controller that you operate it with your tongue, so you got the taste, the uh, you know, thing going. I'm just not going to think about that for too long. I, I do know that some cinemas are, are tinkering with the whole idea of, of you know, smell. Um, oh, God. Uh, and I think I actually, I, I actually recall having read of someone uh, creating a, a smell synthesizer. So it's not just... <laughs> 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 it, sounds like great, it sounds like a great electronic band, doesn't it? Oh my God! I just want, <laughs> I just want to that. see Philip Glass get on stage and just press all the keys <laughs> at the same time. Take this, you pigs! <laughs> like some some person who really really hates the audience just goes up and just oh, hits man. the fart key. <laughs> <laughs> Trent Reznor playing heaven in slavery. <laughs> You have killed me. You have now yeah. killed me. This one jumped the shark. <laughs> I have found you can find happiness in. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what time is it? No, uh. Robin, bring out the common bear. <laughs> <laughs> the big come down suddenly has a whole new meaning to it. Oh. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna go to that concert. I also wanna have a gas mask with the ready. Yeah. <laughs> if you start playing the red shit, I know what I'm in for. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I can tell from your face you're running through the entire nine inch nails to scarf. What's the next joke? What's the next joke? <laughs> Like trying to find something that will benefit from the use of the smell synthesizer. <laughs> the smell synthesizer. Oh, I love that. Right. So, uh, why I, I let me just get one last. You know, imagine the song from the slip, "Letting You." Imagine it's not about letting someone get away with something political. <laughs> it's about the person. It's about the person who parts on the bus. Oh god, no, 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 and now, now, now I'm just you know going completely off track. But you know the line, I jump from every rooftop, and <laughs> now I'm just thinking this guy in a leather jacket jumping off rooftop. Going, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh good, Ke I Kevin Wallace suggested March of the Pigs. <laughs> that is <a> symphony of. <laughs> Right. So this has now turned into a Nine Inch Nails appreciation podcast. Anyway, um, <laughs> you could also do like Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, <laughs> which basically <laughs> just generates into rhythmic sneezing. <laughs> just, I love the idea. With a little help from my friends, and all of a sudden, three people walk out and all start playing. <laughs> Stop it! This has gone on for far enough. <laughs> so. Anyway, um, I can't see because my eyes are all teary up. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm having was... a hard time not corpsing. <laughs> the time for that has passed, my friend. Uh, so, anyway, uh, I think we're about to wrap up. Anyway, I just, I just wanted yeah. to, um, because we are the backseat designers, and we're supposed to. And I, now, I, now I've made a big, big case of not fucking with the formula because text adventures can, uh, through their only medium available written word can evoke things that no graphic adventure game could ever do. 
yeah. So here, here was here was my idea. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do it. <laughs> it's this idea of yours terribly <laughs> important. I'm gonna reach through the screen and no. This is um, more important than the awesome might of the smell synthesizer. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell this briefly, and then we could go back to fucking with the smell. Because that's a brilliant. We should kickstart that thing. It's that's yeah, a we should. brilliant idea. Yeah, maybe get Ken <laughs> Allen in on it. Yeah. Oh, the, oh! Imagine, imagine the hellish bells with the smells. What would they smell like? Pretty rank, probably. <laughs> like, like old brass, like old rotting <laughs> brass. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, my my idea for, for I'm just gonna get this out there now. Now I've I've built up enough hype. Uh, the the tech adventure idea that I had with uh, my old writing partner Leonard. Uh, was that uh, we would do a cyberpunk text adventure game, like you've mentioned, but uh, instead of it just being purely walk here, pick the shit up, go do that, like standard Infocom, the main hub of the game, so to speak, would be an IRC window, and you would sit there and chat with the different uh, uh, IRC bots, and some of them would send you on missions and such, and once you got sent on a mission, then it would turn into, you know, your standard text adventure kind of deal, but most of the time, you would be sitting around, you know, bargaining with IRC bots, uh, which mission should I go on, what sort of cybernetic imp implants should I be getting for this, and, uh, and all of this stuff, um, which is uh, an idea that I don't think I've seen before but then again haven't played that many text adventures and uh, Leonard was supposed to program it and then he you know went off and got someone pregnant or something if you get your eye over the, on on the uh, IRC channel Kevin probably has a suggestion you know it, it's been done down to a T you just oh. don't know the game <laughs> oh pulling your leg of course it hasn't been done uh, that was personal. But anyway, uh, something that we should uh, pick up for a later uh, uh, topic actually is that uh, Kevin and I and uh, Amir and Akako and uh, some other people, we were talking also on the Facebook group about multiplayer adventure game. We should pick that up for a discussion at some point. Yeah, because uh, it's something that never really took off historically. But there were efforts. There were efforts. There were ideas. We should totally cover them at some points. I've, I've made my uh, I've made my thing. Um, I'm looking forward to joining you finally. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're dead. <laughs> you're, you're gone. It's a gone. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so okay, bri bri briefly capping this off. If, if you were going to, uh, because um, one thing that I really lauded uh, Lisa Shoot Larry 7 for was that it tried to uh, pull in the uh, text adventure idea of a parser. Obviously, you still had graphics, you still had sound, you still had all the bells and whistles, so it was not a text adventure. Uh, could you uh, foreseeably do a? Uh, not even sure what the. Uh, not even sure what the question is anymore. Uh, that's an entirely different discussion. What the hell am I saying? Ah, uh, no, no. What what I'm saying was you know freedom of movement. You're you're, you're losing it, Sam. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, what what I'm saying about was rasp, freedom of interaction. Uh, if you were gonna if you were gonna do an adventure game, would you rather have? This was my question. Would you rather have you know all the bells and whistles of all the sensory input that you can throw at a player, or would you be uh, completely free in your own mind to try and put images into the other person's play? Because you have on the one hand, you're solely reliable on your own talent, and you may not. You may not end up being as good a writer as you thought you were, and you might end up not, you know, creating the images in the minds of the player that you thought you would. Or would you rather, you know, have graphics, have bells, have whistles? Oh, wow, you're asking me whether I would rather have bells and whistles, or uh... or just be your own probably, boss. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a fairly visual guy. You know, um, I, I like reading and I like uh, coming up with my own mental images, but I'm just not very good at it. You know, I recall back when I was reading Harry Potter, there are all these description of Hogwarts being like a giant castle. Of course, uh, I knew it was a school and my brain insisted on having Hogwarts look like my public school, which, spoilers, is not an old castle. And I, have, I have no fucking idea why you, you had these. Uh, you just had these bricks and mortar chemistry rooms. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. By the end of it, but my brain somehow managed to make all this work. And yeah, exactly. 
but it it also means that you can you can have a whole level a whole different level of discussion with your friends like uh, like oh did did you did you see the part where he did yeah yeah that was brilliant i mean what did you see in your mind's eye and then you can sort of uh, you know stroke yourselves and then put a biscuit in the corner and something like that. that's a very geeky conversation to have and I, I doubt you know it's not a conversation that many people outside of academic circles have you know you have those conversations regarding uh, stuff like uh, Dante's divine comedy you know where uh, you know uh, inferno and purgatory are described relatively clear but paradise is kind of a blur as far as I've heard so you know that you 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 in in those circles you will invariably end up discussing stuff that is from the writer left up to the interpretation. But you know it's not really something you gather with uh, friends over a pint of beer uh, to you talk. You could about. you have yeah, that's why you have book clubs. I mean you can have that discussion and also you can you can make a vague description of something something very ethereal something that would be very very hard to uh, to construct in a visual sense in a graphic adventure game like if you were if you were going to do dante's uh, uh, you know journey as a, as a as a computer game depicting heaven i mean shit who's who's going to who's going to even try to do that that's true that's true so should we should we call it we probably should yeah so uh, hats on you can't even see the hat. I mean, I, I look, I look I, like I, fucking I, I, Holly in Red Dwarf. I smell it. Did you did you press one of the keys again? I may have. Hmm, that's a good one. <laughs> I just love the idea of. <laughs> oh, the smell synthesizer. I want I want to see Marilyn Manson take this on tour. The man you smell. <laughs> the, the man that you smell is the man that you fear. <laughs> Right, so on that note, uh, we... Oh, my shite. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Anti-shite superstar. No. Ah, um, uh, shit. Uh, uh, yeah, literally. Um, yeah, interesting. So, uh, please, uh, anyone who's listening, please don't invent computers that can produce smells because, you know, that would be really weird. And because uh, we're going to kickstart it. Yeah, that, also that. Please don't steal a proprietary technology. Coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> So let's uh, let's get the spiel out of the way before we go. Oh, right. the spiel! Right, you want you want to take the spiel? Yeah, I'm just gonna do the contract contractual obligation here. Uh, right, because I can see you sort of gearing up to it. Yeah, yeah. we have to thank our uh, HR <laughs> backer over on uh, Patreon, uh, Mr. Steve Alexander of Infamous Quests. Uh, Hi, Steve. Who is in the process of uh, wrapping up a very successful Kickstarter uh, that he did with his uh, company for uh, three new adventure games. Yay! Luck, thank you. We shall waste your $8 and never be friends again, and it'll be a very enjoyable experience. But you are going to see me kiss the webcam. Yeah. Oh, I love you, Steve. And I'm synthesizing a special smell just for you. <laughs> yes, you should be patch number one. Oh man, this the someone someone playing at a wedding with the smell synthesizer, and this one goes out to the lucky couple. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just know that the uh, you know the, uh, the the smell patch for Stephen Alexander is going to be the smell of a baked potato. It's yeah. it's, it's going to be this yeah beautiful wafting potato we smell. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, 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 do continue. There's something about a Twitter and a Facebook group and a Patreon. Yeah, basically, you, you should uh, yeah. head on over to uh, BackseatDesigners.com, which is the oh, yeah, website. Yeah. Backseat Designer Ines. Uh, we also have a Twitter. Uh, the handle is BS Designers. Um, we have a Facebook group called um, Backseat Designers. You might begin to notice a pattern here. And the more I say this, the more tired I am becoming of it. We also have a <laughs> Plus page, uh, a YouTube channel. Um, search for Backseat Designers. You can't go wrong. We have an IRC chat channel too, uh, which is where Kevin Wallace, uh, Mr. Pixel Fun himself, uh, berates us for not knowing the games we talk about. It's called Backseat. Rightly so. And it's on a free note, and there's an easy gateway into it uh, via backseatdesigners.com. And of course, if you prefer going old school, just listening to us ramble, there's backseatdesigners.putbean.com where you can access all the audio episodes. And oh my God, I need a drink of water. <laughs> that was that was a good one, though. Yeah, I'm 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 gonna golf clap you on that one. 
We're just was... gonna record it and just play it back at the end of every episode. We should do that. We should. <laughs> We should just have this, you know, like 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 they do at the end of drug uh, drug commercials in the U.S. Just go make us the side effects. Oh, 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 oh. Like this <laughs> auctionarius kind of. You can breach us at vaccine disorder. Just come. You have to go to the vaccine. Um, not I'm, responsible for lost body parts. <laughs> not responsible for lost body parts or the smell of decay. Thank you. <laughs> and or smells in general. <laughs> Emanating from the synthesizer. Oh, and if you've enjoyed this little rambunctious uh, thing, uh, please go to patreon.com. I can't mention that enough because if you have too much money and you feel like you should somehow unburden yourself of it, why not donate that uh, to us? Because uh, we won't use it for anything evil, we promise. We'll take good care of it. Yes, we will. Uh, we might this buy is hats. My, this, is my, this is my trustworthy face. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, you guys listening to the audio portion, you have no idea what you just missed. <laughs> I'm just going to turn off the broadcast before you scare someone's children. Okay, stop doing that, please. <laughs> I thought you were going to turn off the broadcast. I thought it was going to be the, you know, the last thing that people see. All right, do it again. I'm going to turn off the broadcast. Dun, 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 dun. Um, I just... um. I just need something to aid me over here. You know, hold on, hold on. We'll uh, edit this out in post. No, no we won't. won't. No we censorship. We won't no edit editing. jack shit. This is like uh, this is the mo this is the loosest episode ever. Okay, you uh, you ready? Ding. No more for today. Mm -hmm.